Today we're going to look at the Panzer IV family of vehicles. Starting off, we're going to look at the D. So this started production in about October 1939 and went through to about October 1940 and they produced about 238 of this vehicle. As is believed to be the only drivable with original driveline Panzer 4D left in the world. So it is a quite a nice rare vehicle for the museum to have in drivable condition. So with the Panzer IVs, especially the early ones right up to E, a good distinction at the front is when we look at Panzer IV A, D and E, they have the stepped front. The driver being a little bit forward has a little bit better vision uh, at the front of his block. And we also see the introduction of the ball mount, which made a return, because before that we just had the uh, pistol port. Now for those who do know already and picked it up, yes, the two-piece driver's visor is upside down. We'll get to that at a later stage. But you can also see just up the top there, the two little holes. So in combat, when he closes his visor, he has what's called a KFF uh, binocular sight, which slides from uh, his uh, right-hand side over to the left and he can look out of those uh, the binocular sight to see where he's going. So with Panzer IVs, the early ones right up until I think we get into the H and the J, we still have the uh, front bolted mount towing points on here where on the J we'll look at later, it's actually built into the side of the actual vehicle. We look at Panzer III's and Panzer IVs, there's a lot of different track types. Adam Mann does a really good description of these tracks online. But right up until E, we have a 36 centimetre wide track, but the pins are 38 centimetres, and that's where we generally measure it from. After E, we generally go to a 38 centimetre track with a 40 centimetre pin. So that's where we sort of get those measurements from, which you'll, you'll see along the way. So we've got spring suspension, but early on when they were looking at the suspension for these, there was initial thoughts that they wanted to go to the shuck to loof work, so the interleaved overlapping road wheel type suspension. Then they looked at uh, torsion bar suspension, which the Panzer III has, but for simplicity, they went to the spring suspension. Um, whether it come down to time constraints or cost, not sure. So on Panzer IVs, we have eight sets of road wheels, and Panzer III's had six, so it's basically double the, the, uh, the number in the uh, designation. If we look at the A, B, and C, they have a lot more grill sections within uh, this back area here. D went to a simplified one bar grill. Uh, this allowed for a lot more air to come in and we see this simplification through the other Panzer IV models as well. So I'm gonna talk briefly about the guns. So this is the uh, Kampfwagen Canone 37 L24. The D was the first variant to have the external mantlet and the uh, protection around the, the recoil system. So the gun being a 7.5 centimeter was good for that infantry support role early on, uh, same as when we look at the Stug 3. It was good in the fact that it was good for the infantry support role, so we could still take out bunkers and that sort of thing, and we can sort of engage armour. You probably wouldn't want to go any more than 700 metres with that armour piercing round, but when we go into L43, L48, that's when they really come into their own. I'm currently sitting in the driver's position. You're in the, what we'd call, essentially the radio operator's position. So quite a lot of room within here. Uh, Six-speed manual transmission. This one's uh, really easy to, to drive. The clutch is really nice. Uh, with the transmission, we also have a, a little pedal down here. you have actually got to push that in to get it in reverse so you can't accidentally uh, put it in reverse as you're changing gears. Now, as I said, with the visor system, with the KFF, we're not sort of uh, really complete in here for where it would be, but it would sit about here. And then we slide it across and you can actually see the two holes that the driver would look at. So in combat condition, you can uh, unlock his handle and pull the visors up and then lock them in. So you can see that the visor's closed and then we're gonna open it back up. Got a visor port here. So on later variants, when we get to H, uh, we start eliminating uh, these side points and we've got about a 10 centimeter thick bulletproof glass that sits uh, inside here as well. So on the brake drum, we can actually adjust um, our brake tension. Because essentially when we pull back, we're pulling on the brake um, and at some points, you know, after a while, if your brake pads have heated up or worn down, you can actually adjust your brake pads to lock on a little bit better. So these are vision ports we have, one for the loader, and we also have one for the gunner. And when we look at the later variants, we'll look at these because they also eliminate these ports um, because there was uh, sort of designated as a weak point. 
Armour on the Panzer IV D, 30 millimetres of armour on the front, uh, on the front of the turret, uh, 20 millimetres on the side uh, of the hull and the turret. This is the Panzer IV E. So this is the, what we believe to be the only known Panzer IV E left in the world. It's a static uh, exhibit, so it doesn't run, but it's got a few changes from the Panzer IV D. Essentially from the front, our brake accesses are now flush. So if you have a look back on the Panzer IV D, they sit a little bit higher. On the driver's vision block, we go to one visor now instead of the, the split visor that comes together. And you can see on the front of here, we've got extra 30 millimetres of armour. So now we're up to uh, about 60 millimetres of armour on the front, 20 millimetres of armour on the sides and along the hull as well. So they did have an increase uh, along the way, especially starting for me, to provide the extra bit of armour for the crew. A little piece of metal underneath the gun. So that is an antenna deflector. So as the turret traverses around, that deflector can push the antenna away. So when we get vehicles to do restorations within the museum, occasionally we'll come across bits and pieces of armour that has original markings. As we see, we've got the Balkan cruise here. So we've essentially left it because it's good to actually see where the markings were on these vehicles along the way. Oh, there's another one? Yeah, there's another one on the back which we've left. Now, Daryl and Jesse did this restoration in the, in the museum and they did a, a fantastic job uh, with this. You can see we've got the, the, the box on the back uh, where they generally stow all their gear. Uh, it's got a lot of battle damage on that, so we've left it as is. Well, being thin metal, they're the first things to rust out completely. So whether this was preserved somehow, you know, could have been left in a barn, we just don't know. Now on the back here, along with the exhaust, I've also got this box here. So this uh, right up until G, Panzer IV G, is uh, smoke grenades that sit in the back and there's a little cover that's here that's rusted and you can actually see them down in there. So this is where they would uh, put smoke grenades and they'd literally uh, be able to fire them over the top of the vehicle. So the cupolas were essentially changed from D onwards, so now we have five vision blocks all the way around. We've still got the split hatch. The split hatch goes into uh, Panzer IV G. Uh, from G, they start using a mixture of uh, the split hatch and a single hatch opening. From E, we went into F1, which was still the L24 short 7.5 centimeter. And we transitioned it into the F2, or what the British called the special. This is now where we start going into the L43 uh, gun. The difference between what we're looking at now, on the F2, we had a rounded muzzle brake. So this stayed around for about three months. This is the Panzer IV G. With this, we're going to what we call the Campwagen Canone 40, L43. So when we look at the L, so the length and 43, what we've got is I'll grab one of my 7.5 centimetre armour piercing ballistic cap rounds. So when we talk about the length of the barrel, we go from our 7.5 centimetre, and if we put it in this direction, L43 is 43 times 7.5 from the breech end to the muzzle end. The track is a little bit wider, so now we've got a 38 centimetre wide track, but with the 40 centimetre pin. So we've got a little bit wider track, which uh, lowers that ground pressure just slightly. 50 millimetres of armour, with that later on addition with an extra 30 millimetres of armour, so it takes us up to 80. We've now lost the loader's vision block, so essentially now it makes it a little bit easier for production, and it reduces that uh, weak spot within the, uh, the front of the turret. This turret, for those who have a very keen eye, yes, this is a G, but this is a H turret. We know that straight away because from sort of when we go into G's, but especially into H, is where we, we start fitting our shirts and skirts around not only the turret, but the hull. So these mounting points here and the two up the top are the actual remnants of the bracket for the shirts and that would uh, be around uh, this turret. There's plans to have more Panzer IV variants within the museum, probably maybe looking at a B and a H. So this turret will end up going on that H variant that we're gonna do, and we've got enough components, essentially, to make a proper G turret. 
Suspension, uh, exactly the same. Still has the Maybach HL 120 TRM. Uh, puts out about 300 horsepower. When we get into H's and J's, uh, especially with that longer barrel, extra armour uh, on the front, does place a lot of strain on the front of the vehicle. And even when these fired, they'd said to sort of, you know, get that little bit of a rocking motion uh, because they did add extra weight, but didn't really give it uh, any more beefier suspension or extra uh, power with the engine. Final rendition of the Panzer IV, so the Panzer IV J. This is actually the most uh, prevalent model that was made. They made over 3,000 of these. So in all, with uh, Panzer IVs, they made a little over 8,500 of these vehicles. So they were the most mass-produced tank for the Germans. So this one's got a, a number of key changes. The single block of 80 millimeter armor uh, on the front. I'm gonna try and get this word right. It's draft geflect. It's a Scherzen skirt, wire Scherzen, to help prevent penetration from the side because the Russian 14.5 uh, any tank rifle could actually penetrate the sides of these. And also bazooka if the Americans are, are firing at them or Piet uh, for the British. But as we saw in other Panzer IVs, we had rubber guide rollers. These now have gone to steel uh, guide rollers um, and we essentially go from four to three. If we're going for a full plate Scherzen, it's five millimetres thick. Up on the turret, we've got eight millimetre thick uh, Scherzen. So this gives them extra protection for the turret. Still allows them to open their doors uh, to be able to uh, exit the vehicle. On the doors, as we would have seen on the, the G, we had vision ports. So on these two doors now, we've eliminated that vision port because once we close these shirts and hatches, you can't see out, so there's no point in having them. So they just uh, remove them from the, uh, the doors. With the uh, Coppola, we saw uh, the, uh, the differences where they had both a split hatch and a single hatch. On the J, we've just gone to the single hatch. Here, so we've got three circular points here. They are the mounting point, which is welded on for the two-ton jib crane. So we can actually mount it up and this allows us to do work on the vehicle. The original roof's thickness, we go from uh, the G into the H. From the H, we go from 11 mil thick to 16 mil thick, which is also transitioned into this roof as well. Don't call it an aerial. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. It's an antenna. So we both receive and transmit. So a notable point to that was most German vehicles up to about 1941 had receivers, the majority of them. The commanders would generally have receiver transmitters. Uh, from after 41, that's where we see a lot of the German tanks having both uh, receiver and transmitter radios. So on the Panzer IV-E, we saw that antenna uh, deflector. They moved the antenna to the left rear, so it's out of the way because essentially we don't want to be shooting over the back deck. If we need to do that, something's wrong. Along the way, again, with constraints with materials, sometimes these would have been just a uh, metal spring uh, that would allow it to, to move. At the back of the vehicle, we see a change in the exhaust. So on most of the other Panzer IVs, we'd see a cylindrical horizontal exhaust. Now we have the two exhausts that go vertical, and these ones also uh, prevent flame uh, from uh, coming out, because the last thing you want is at night time is for vehicles to backfire and have flame coming out. So they're essentially brackets to hold a paper that changes color in the event of a chemical or gas attack. So the paper sits on there, and if they do come into an area where that's uh, contaminated with uh, chemicals or gas, that will change color, and that will allow the crew commander to be able to uh, close the, the vehicle down and have some sort of protection from any of those contaminants. So like Tiger, Panther, now the toe points are actually integral part to the side uh, armour plate of the vehicle. So it does give them a little bit of extra strength when you're trying to uh, tow a vehicle out. This was one of, along with Panzer III, one of the few vehicles that actually saw service pre-war right up till the end of the war. So an iconic vehicle in all variants. Great upgrades along the way by the Germans, including the gun and the siding system. So if you want to have a ride in the D, the G or the J, make yourself available for Oz Armour Fest last weekend in August of 2024.